What do you think of when you hear the words lost media? Think of an example. What comes to mind? Lost media has become one of the internet's obsessions over the past few years, with an entire community forming around searching for and archiving lost works, which makes it all the more interesting that the definition of lost media is surprisingly vague. In the broadest terms, lost media is media which is, well, lost. You can't experience it anymore. Even though at one point you could have. In an era where everything is documented and archived, when we're told that the internet is forever and it seems like nothing can ever be truly forgotten, when you find out something you remember, something a lot of people remember, is simply gone, well, that's unsettling. How did that happen? Surely someone must still have this TV episode sitting on a VHS tape in their attic, or this old doom wad I remember on a floppy disk somewhere, right? When something is lost, that's a mystery, a challenge. It turns out there are a lot of people out there who have turned answering that challenge into a hobby. And because of the nature of this hobby, even when something does get found, there's always five new discoveries to take its place. The difference between lost media now and what it once was is that lost media is now a pursuit to its own end. It used to be only Doctor Who fans seemed interested in the existence of lost episodes, but now the media itself is almost irrelevant. The interest is around the mystery and the search itself. Sites like the Lost Media Wiki exist to catalog missing pieces of media and what progress has been made in the search for each. Tools like the Wayback Machine have become essential in the field of internet archaeology, which has itself become an increasingly legitimized idea. Don't get me wrong, some of these pieces of media have interest because of their value, but that's not always the case anymore. People aren't necessarily searching for lost Cartoon Network bumpers because they really want to see these specific bumpers, but just out of some desire to create a world where all media no matter how obscure and how irrelevant, is preserved. The explosion of popularity surrounding lost media in recent years perhaps makes it all the more surprising that what exactly lost media is seems to be a source of constant debate. If you go to nearly any channel whose focus is lost media, then you won't have to dig too far to find someone in the comment section of some video arguing that the subject in question doesn't qualify as lost media at all. This topic really grabbed my attention when YouTuber L Supersonic Q, who specializes in lost media, recently released a video called Pieces of Lost Media That Are Theoretically Lost. Now, to be totally clear, LSSQ himself basically characterizes that video as a thought experiment slash joke, but in his own words, This is a category that covers topics which might exist, but cannot be proven to, or content that never existed at all, but could have. What I think is a very accurate example relates to a main category that I see brought up and discussed all the time, commercials and bumpers. When does a search for something like the CN City bumpers end? How do you know when you found them all? There is currently no list or specific documentation on which ones exist and which ones don't. But without a list to reference, I can only theorize that there's probably more out there no one remembers or has come across before. The next topic I'd like to discuss touches upon a different area of theoretical lost media. This is content that could have existed, but never actually did. A great example of this that I'm definitely in the minority to bring up is the 4Kids dub of One Piece. They actually reduced the number of episodes and only dubbed those ones. So not only did we never get a 4Kids dub for the full extent of episodes that were available at the time, but now that the company doesn't even exist anymore, a continuation of the series wouldn't be possible. To me, that's theoretical lost media because there were never plans to keep it going, and no unreleased audio from future episodes exist either. That seemed like a stretch to me. But when thinking about why, I realized that there were cases of absolutely iconic lost media which could be argued to fit into this definition. More to the point, there are things which I consider to be lost media, 
but which don't fit the strictest definition of it. Even the Lost Media Wiki, which I'm viewing for the purposes of this video as one of, if not the, definitive catalogs of Lost Media, seems to not be able to nail down exactly what does and does not qualify, with a more we'll-know-it-when-we-see-it approach. The Lost Media Wiki guidelines state things like, new articles on Lost dubs are also taken on a case-by-case -case basis, and Articles on prototype builds of a game, popularly dubbed betas or alphas, should only be made if there is solid evidence that there were builds with significant differences to the final product. Screenshots, video, interviews, etc. Phrases like case-by-case -case basis are obviously subjective in nature. That's interesting, right? Lost media seems like such a descriptive phrase. It's media that was lost. Yet, as the community behind Lost Media has grown, and interest has only gotten greater, more and more edge cases reveal how complicated the question of what exactly is Lost Media, and more importantly what isn't Lost Media, becomes. Today, I'd like to spend a little time talking about edge cases of Lost Media, and how surprisingly complicated the question of what is Lost Media actually is. The point of this video, to be clear, isn't really to talk in depth about any of these examples of lost media, what they are, why they're significant, or the history of the searches, and I'll only be giving a broad description of the pieces of media in general, and providing references to other sources which cover each of them in much greater detail down in the description. Some of the pieces of media which I'll be talking about here are actually no longer lost, some of them are now found media. But again, that's not really relevant to the point of this video. No, the point of this video is to talk about lost media itself, the concept, and how some very iconic searches done by the greater lost media community arguably stretch the definition. The point here also isn't to definitively prove that any of these categories are or are not lost media, or to accuse anyone of being right or wrong for considering a piece as such. Some of the things I'll be talking about in this video are meant to be incredible reaches, things which push the definition of lost media so far past the obvious spirit of the expression that it's clear they shouldn't count. The reason I'm going to bring up cases like that is not to argue that these things should be lost media, but to use the fact that I've clearly pushed past the line of what defines lost media to illustrate the fact that such a line exists in the first place. Think of it like an equation. If you know a function is continuous, then you plug in one number and get a positive, and you plug in another number and get a negative, that tells you that at some point between those two numbers, the value absolutely must be zero. Well, if I give one example of something that clearly does count as lost media, and another example of something that clearly should not count as lost media, then that indicates that somewhere between those two examples is a line which defines, for you, what is lost media. My goal with this video isn't to define any sort of objective definition for where the line is to be drawn. In fact, I'll be deliberately refraining from giving my own opinion on whether each of these categories qualify as lost media or not, with one exception. Instead, the point of this video is simply to highlight how complicated the question actually is, and hopefully reframe your own understanding of lost media and the way in which we talk about it. It's also worth noting that a lot of the categories which I've broken ambiguous lost media into in the rest of this video have considerable overlap with each other. Unreleased media and cancelled media and drastically changed media are very similar ideas, even though I think I make a case for ways in which they are distinct, and there is some ambiguous overlap even between these categories I'm trying to break apart here. That's just the nature of talking about this subject, ambiguity on top of ambiguity. There's no black and white with any of this. This video is about diving headfirst into a sea of grey. Without further ado, let's get started. To begin talking about the ways in which lost media as a term can be stretched, we need to start with a solid baseline. Some examples of lost media which virtually everyone agrees on. These are the most obvious, clear-cut examples of lost media, examples which I've never seen anyone disagree with. I think the most commonly accepted example of lost media, the type of lost media where you can be talking to someone who has never even heard of the lost media community, and which they'll immediately understand what you're talking about, 
is the lost episode. To begin talking about that subject, we should talk about the beginning of preserving television in general. The early years of television largely saw the medium as disposable. Episodes were broadcast, and if you saw them, then you saw them. If you didn't, well, you would just see the next one instead. Television wasn't preserved and re-aired because why would anyone want to watch the same episode twice? This was changed in 1951 with the series I Love Lucy. I Love Lucy is one of the most important television series of all time. It broke cultural boundaries by centering around the relationship between a white woman and a Cuban-American man. It pushed the boundaries of what was considered too risque for television with a season depicting Lucille Ball as pregnant, during which censorship prevented the show from even using the word pregnant. Yes, really. It's aged a bit now, and it doesn't seem subversive or risque at all by modern standards, but keep in mind, this was the 50s. The early 50s. 70 years ago. All of this was tremendously groundbreaking. But more relevant to this discussion is how I Love Lucy was a true pioneer of television technology. Lucille Ball wanted to perform in front of a live studio audience because that was the environment in which she was comfortable. But such a thing was unheard of in the early years of single-camera sitcoms, which instead used so-called canned laughter. The standard of the time was to broadcast sitcom episodes live on the East Coast and provide much lower quality kinescope versions of the episodes, literally filming a TV monitor playing the live broadcast for the West Coast to watch. I Love Lucy decided instead of using a single camera and broadcasting the episode, they would shoot each episode on film with three cameras in front of a live studio audience, essentially performing each episode as a stage play and then editing together a television version from the three shots later on. It's impossible to overstate how important this multi-camera setup was to the future of television. This multi-camera setup is often credited with another historic achievement. During the production of the second season of I Love Lucy, Lucille Ball became pregnant and was unable to continue shooting the show to fulfill the agreed-to episode order with CBS. As a solution, it was decided to re-air some already completed episodes from the first season of the show, giving birth to the rerun. To the surprise of everyone involved, reruns ended up being wildly popular, which led to the standard of preserving episodes of television we see today. Because of this radical change in the way television was produced, with live broadcasts being out and filmed recording being in, it meant that TV was being archived in ways it had never been before. Of course, over the decades, this would also lead to the ability to tell serialized, instead of episodic, stories in television. This also means that before all of this, television essentially went unarchived entirely and it would be decades before the archival and home media release of television series made complete series available as a standard. This meant that most episodes of most TV series made before 1951 are lost episodes, and many episodes for decades after would be as well. One example, perhaps the most well-known of all, are the lost episodes of Doctor Who. Doctor Who is a long-running British science fiction television series beginning in 1963 and still going today. There are over 800 episodes of Doctor Who, but as a result of how old the series is, 97 of these episodes are missing. Television wasn't always preserved for reruns in the way it is now, and episodes would often be deleted for the practical purpose of simply reusing film for newer episodes. The downside to I Love Lucy pioneering the idea of filming episodes was that the production costs skyrocketed. Film isn't cheap now, let alone 70 years ago. The policy of junking old episodes didn't officially come to a close until 1978, although many episodes were already being kept before that. What's interesting about these lost episodes is that they aren't entirely lost. Portions of them still remain. For example, the serial where the first Doctor regenerated, also the first appearance of the Cybermen, was lost, but the actual part of that serial where he is seen regenerating has remained intact. The audio for all of these episodes has also been found, largely through home recordings done by viewers at the time of the episode's first airing, and the search for missing Doctor Who episodes has remained of constant interest for decades, which has resulted in many of the previously missing episodes being recovered. Television wasn't the only example of a medium whose early days were largely seen as disposable. 
Famously, the Library of Congress estimates that 75% of all silent films are thought to be lost forever. Video games had the benefit of largely beginning in the form of widely released media, so they've been, in a sense, spared from this fate, as even old arcade cabinets and cartridges largely remain intact. But there are plenty of widely known examples of lost games as well. Personally, I think the most interesting example of fully lost games are the lost Satellaview and Sega Channel games. In the 90s, both Nintendo and Sega released what are essentially streaming services for games, although they worked very differently to what we think of as modern streaming services. The Satellaview, only ever available in Japan, was a paid service add-on to the Super Famicom, which began in 1995 and was discontinued in 2000. The service used satellites to broadcast video games to users at specific times, similar to how a television broadcast worked. The games were only available at these times, and would be deleted if you turned the Super Famicom off. As a result, virtually all of these games, including variants of series like The Legend of Zelda, are completely lost with many of these broadcasts being so obscure that only 116 of the known 231 games broadcast are even documented, with the remaining games being unknown. The Sega Channel was a similar idea, released in 1994 and discontinued in 1998, although this service was released in North America, and it operated over cable instead of satellite, through a partnership with Time Warner Cable. These titles were not broadcast at specific times, but rather had a library of games available which were rotated in and out on a monthly basis. Games would be downloaded to the Sega Genesis, and would be deleted upon turning the system off. As a result, many of these games are also currently considered completely lost, with one of the best known examples being Garfield The Lost Levels, as it is now known by fans. These were three additional levels to the platformer game Garfield Caught in the Act, and as of now, they are completely lost. Another example of lost media is content created using Flash. Adobe Flash was once the king of the internet, with a giant install base. When Adobe Flash was officially discontinued on December 31st, 2020, vast amounts of the Flash era of the internet became inaccessible. Everything from Flash games to websites to news sources from the era were lost, while much of this was backed up by internet archivist groups, with how widespread Flash was in its heyday, huge amounts of content were lost, perhaps forever. These are all examples of the most clear-cut, by-the-books definition of lost media. Things which were once released to the public and widely accessible, but are no longer available. So, now that we've established a baseline, let's make this a little bit more complicated. What about media that isn't lost, it's just inaccessible. So the examples I listed above are clear-cut because not only are they not available to the public, but they're not available to anyone. As far as anyone knows, none of the above examples are even available in the archives of the original creators. Elements of games like BS Legend of Zelda, which broadcast an audio track, are believed to be entirely lost. But what about examples of media that the creators or the rights holders still have, they just haven't re-released to the public? Are these things lost? Is something lost simply because it isn't widely available on the internet? In other words, can we really call something lost if we know where it is? My favorite example of this is Sesame Street episode 847, the Wicked Witch of the West Loses Her Broomstick. Sesame Street 847 was aired in the February of 1976, and featured a celebrity guest star, Margaret Hamilton, reprising her role as the Wicked Witch of the West from the film The Wizard of Oz. Hamilton's performance ended up frightening some children, and upset parents wrote in to Sesame Street, which eventually ended up with the episode being banned from re-airings. The entire ordeal seemed to be something of an embarrassment to the legacy of Sesame Street, so it wasn't even released to any home media or streaming platforms over the years, which led to it becoming a highly desired piece of lost media. The thing is, it was never actually lost. 
it was still sitting in the Sesame Street archives, and in 2019 was moved to the American Archive of Public Broadcasting, who specialize in maintaining and preserving the legacy of things exactly like Sesame Street. So great, it was archived, what's the problem? Well, see, the thing is, the American Archive of Public Broadcasting isn't a public archive. It's only available to select researchers with approval. So the question is, was Sesame Street 847 lost media? It was preserved. It was archived. We knew exactly where it was. We just couldn't actually watch it. I think the reason why this example is so interesting is because it sort of gives lie to one of the most common reasons given for why lost media should be recovered. Archival purposes. Historical preservation. If the only reason to recover lost media is for it to be archived, well then, mission achieved. While I agree that those things are important, I think what happened next in this story shows that it isn't just about archival. It's not just about preservation. It's about letting people see these lost treasures. We all want to actually see these things, or at the very least know that we can see these things. Which is what eventually happened when the lost Sesame Street episode made its way onto the internet after the American Archive of Public Broadcasting experienced an illegal data breach. That's right, someone heisted it. It's a heist, a criminal crime. Sesame Street was burglarized, and as a result, you can now find that episode on the internet. Here's another example. Out of Jimmy's head. I'm fascinated by the ongoing search for the Cartoon Network hybrid live-action animated series Out of Jimmy's Head, because I remember watching it and watching the film that served as a pilot for the series reanimated. A bizarre series about a kid who is in a life-threatening accident at Disneyland and can only be saved by receiving a brain transplant, with the only brain available being the frozen brain of Walt Disney stored in the Disney vault, which ends up giving him the superpower of hallucinations, seeing animated characters talking to him in his daily life. Out of Jimmy's Head was so disliked that not only was it dropped after its initial 20-episode run, but it was never released to any sort of home media. No DVDs, no streaming services, nothing. If you want to go watch Out of Jimmy's Head for some reason now, you kind of can't. Ten of the twenty episodes have been recovered from home recordings at the time, but the other ten are only available in foreign language dubs. But again, the question is, can Out of Jimmy's Head be called lost media? It is presumably still perfectly archived in the Cartoon Network vaults somewhere. There's nothing keeping Cartoon Network from suddenly announcing that the full series is just now on HBO Max one morning, and the search would be ended. That's happened before, in fact. An old Disney live-action series, Adventures in Wonderland, had over 100 completely missing episodes, until Disney suddenly posted the full series to Disney+, Plus, with the only remaining lost episode being the episode White Rabbits Can't Jump because it guest starred O.J. Simpson and was set to be released around the time that a slightly well-known investigation and trial was taking place. For more on that, I'll link Defunct Land's video on the series in the description. A video game which is almost synonymous with this idea of inaccessible media is the Konami game P.T., a playable teaser for the cancelled game Silent Hills, which was pulled from download when Silent Hills was cancelled. Although that remains more hard-to-find media than lost media, since the game is still playable on PS4 systems which had it downloaded at the time it was removed. Much like Out of Jimmy's Head or Adventures in Wonderland, this isn't really lost. We know exactly where it is. There's nothing stopping Konami from re-releasing it someday except for the fact that it would make absolutely no sense for their business to do so. Konami would very much like you to forget P.T. and Silent Hills ever existed. And so, with every passing day, P.T. becomes harder to access. At least until some future date where PS4 emulation reaches a state where it is feasible for most users. So, okay, you see how these pieces of media are just a little more ambiguous than the most clear-cut examples of lost media. Generally, these are all agreed to fit the spirit of what is being talked about, and are classified as lost media by, I think, most people. Is it actually lost if we know exactly where it is? That's really just arguing semantics. These all fit the spirit of what people mean when they talk about lost media. But let's take this one step further. 
Everything we've talked about here has been actually available to the public at some point. If the public didn't preserve it, well then it's partially the public's fault that it's lost. But what about media that was completed, but then never actually widely released to the public at all? The Day the Clown Cried is an infamous 1972 film by comedian Jerry Lewis, which became the subject of some well-earned controversy before it ever released, due to its premise of being set in the concentration camps of Nazi Germany, starring a clown who lured people to their deaths in the gas chamber. This controversy became so heated that the film remained unreleased in a nearly finished state. The film also had some production problems, and the creators were involved in legal disputes over it, all of which prevented the final release of the film. The film was privately screened to a few individuals, although how many people actually saw it and verification of who those people are is difficult to come by, but it was never widely released. Jerry Lewis insisted that the film would never be released, but donated a working copy of the film to the Library of Congress a few years before his death, under the condition that it not be screened until at least 2024. All of this has led to it being considered one of the holy grails of lost film, among both the lost media community and film scholars. This sort of thing happens all the time, and for all sorts of reasons. Batman Dracula was a fan film created in 1964 by the famous artist Andy Warhol. If you just went, whoa, what, and would like to know more about that film, so would I, and so would the rest of the world. Clips of it surfaced in the 2006 documentary film Jack Smith and the Destruction of Atlantis, about a fellow artist who starred as both of the titular characters in the film, Batman and Dracula. The film was completely unauthorized, however, and made without any sort of approval from DC Comics. There seems to be some record of it being screened as a part of some of Andy Warhol's art exhibits, but aside from that, very little is known about the film, because of the unauthorized nature of it, as well as the nature of Andy Warhol's… everything. It never saw any sort of wide release, and even the clips of it which have surfaced are hard to find on the internet due to copyright takedowns not by DC Comics, but by the Andy Warhol Museum. It isn't always that complicated, though. One of the most common versions of unreleased media which is searched for is pilot episodes for series, or early projects which eventually became well-known series. One such project is Meso Blues, a short animation created by animator Van Partible in college about an Elvis impersonator. Years later, the short would transform into the series Johnny Bravo, with a completely different premise, and its own pilot completely separate from Meso Blues. Meso Blues has never been released in full, only a few short clips exist, and this is not because it's lost at all, rather, Van Partible himself has the only known remaining copy. Partible, however, doesn't seem to want it released. I can't really blame him. If I'd turned a college project into something I was much prouder of down the line, I wouldn't necessarily want to release a rough draft to the public either. Instead, he has only shown it to his colleagues and friends, and it doesn't seem likely to be released anytime soon. Pilots are a common source of lost media because they are often never released to the public, used to sell a show to the network as well as being a rough draft of the show, with characters, actors, and even target demographic being dramatically changed between pilot and full release. Given that I Love Lucy essentially invented the idea of episodes of television being anything but lost, it might surprise you that I Love Lucy isn't free from its own lost media. Now, if you go watch I Love Lucy on Hulu or similar platforms, there are episodes missing due to licensing reasons. These episodes also largely remained unaired on reruns, for the same reason, but from what I can find, all of these episodes were included in the I Love Lucy The Complete Series DVD box set released in 2015, making them found media. And either way, they were all released at some point. Instead, the example I want to talk about here is the lost pilot episode of I Love Lucy. This pilot was never released, used as, of course, a pilot for the series. The pilot was never aired, and even CBS itself seemed to no longer have a copy of it, until one was found nearly 40 years later, in 1990, restored, and aired as the Lost Episode in April of that year. 
later released on DVD in 2002. Alright, these are all unreleased media, but what about something that's an edge case between released and unreleased media? What about something which was legitimately released on accident? NBA Elite 11 was a basketball game which was meant to be released on October 5th, 2010, but was then cancelled on November 2nd, 2010. You might notice that the second of those dates occurred after the first, and that's why we're talking about it. The quality of a demo released for the game was so disliked that the game was indefinitely delayed at the last minute, after copies had already been pressed and shipped to stores. And when it was determined that the game being released would actively harm the brand more than its release was worth, the game was cancelled. Copies were meant to be shipped back to EA, but not every store got the memo, and a few fleeting copies leaked out. These few copies have become so rare as both sports collectibles and gaming collectibles that they've been listed online for five-figure amounts. So... What is NBA Elite 11 exactly? It's not lost because there are collectors who are known to have working copies of it. It's not cancelled because, I mean, it was completed and shipped to stores. It's not unreleased because a few copies did actually make it into circulation legitimately. But it's not released either because, I mean, it's not as though you could ever reliably go into a GameStop and buy a copy. This is the grey area to end all grey areas, to be sure, but whatever it is, it is agreed by the community at large to be some form of lost media. Do you see how our definition is stretching further and further? The question of what is lost media seems so simple, and yet these edge cases keep calling into question what exactly qualifies. But okay, I hear what you're saying. Maybe something doesn't need to be made publicly available to be considered lost media. Maybe it simply has to be something which was made and cannot be accessed now. Well, let's take this one step further again and ask whether something had to be finished to qualify. When I think of cancelled media, the first thing that comes to my mind is Star Wars 1313. Star Wars 1313, if you don't know, was a Star Wars video game in development when Disney bought the Star Wars franchise in 2012. The game was going to be about Boba Fett adventuring through the criminal underworld of Floor 1313 of Coruscant, a sort of action-adventure, uncharted -y Star Wars AAA spectacle game. Not the other cancelled Star Wars game from EA that had the lead writer of Uncharted on it, though. That's another game entirely. The game was first revealed at E3 in June of 2012, but was cancelled that October when Disney, in their quest to make all Star Wars games mediocre to bad, closed LucasArts. The game was never released, no playable demo was ever made widely available, and much to the chagrin of fans, here we are a decade later and the game has never been picked back up. Some assets have leaked over the years, but if you want to play Star Wars 1313, you essentially can't, because it was never finished. The game doesn't fully exist. The other most famous gaming example, of course, which I already touched upon earlier, is Silent Hills. Silent Hills was an installment of the beloved Silent Hill franchise, which was revealed in August of 2014. The game is most well remembered for the way in which it was revealed, with a seemingly unrelated game called P.T. being released to the PlayStation Network for PlayStation 4. Upon completion of this game, the nature of the teaser would be revealed, announcing that the game would be titled Silent Hills and was going to be developed by Hideo Kojima, in association with Guillermo del Toro, starring Norman Reedus. A month later, a much less well-known piece of footage for the game was shown at Tokyo Game Show, which I only bring up because I don't see people talk about this, the only other footage related to Silent Hills, hardly ever. The reason for the agony fans feel regarding Silent Hills' ultimate cancellation upon Hideo Kojima and Konami publicly and bitterly separating is because PT, even as a demo, is still remembered as one of the best and most influential horror titles of the past decade. This has led Silent Hills, as well, to become one of the most desired pieces of lost media of all time, with even information about the project being highly sought after. Still, even if Silent Hills were released in the state it currently exists in somewhere in a Konami vault, it wouldn't be the Silent Hills people want, because it was never finished. 
That wasn't even the only horror game Guillermo del Toro tried to make, either. Years before Silent Hills, he would work on a different horror game called Insane, being made by THQ, and if you wonder why it never came out, let me direct you to the by THQ part. Guillermo del Toro actually, from what I can find, seems to own the rights to whatever exists of this cancelled game, so fingers crossed he releases more information about it someday. There are countless cancelled films, too, of course, in all sorts of various stages of development. For whatever reason, in the same way Star Wars 1313 is the first thing that comes to my mind about cancelled games, Pixar's Newt is the first thing that comes to mind when I think about cancelled films, and I think that's because of the interesting reason for its cancellation. Newt was a Pixar film intended to release first in 2011 and then in 2012, before being cancelled entirely. The film was going to be about the last remaining male and female blue-footed newts being put together in captivity by scientists in order to repopulate the species. The only problem? These two loony lizards don't get along very well. Some production materials for Newt have surfaced over the years, but the film never made it to the stages of having enough animation finished for a trailer before being cancelled. Why was it cancelled, you ask? Well, if that plot description sounded familiar, that's because it's almost identical to the plot of Blue Sky Studios' film Rio, which actually made it to theaters in 2011. Dueling movies are hardly anything new. Anyone who knows the history of DreamWorks will remember the petty copycat nature of films like Ants deliberately releasing against A Bug's Life, but it seems Pixar was concerned about the films being too similar. The film was initially planned to be retooled before being cancelled entirely, with those working on the film beginning a new project instead, which would later be released as Inside Out. Newt was definitely unfinished, but Looking at the production materials, as well as the press releases for this movie, indicate that there was at least some significant progress made on it. And of course, it was actually announced. But what about projects that were cancelled so early in development that we're not even supposed to know about them? Prototype 3 was never announced by Activision, but it was in the very early stages of development when Prototype 2 released. Prototype 2 was viewed as a sales disappointment, and so Activision cancelled the third game. The most that surfaced of it are some early environmental models, which is really the only way we know that the project existed at all. There are, presumably, more conceptual details like design docs, concept art, and so on which still exist, but it's highly unlikely that anything approaching a playable game exists, so is Prototype 3 lost media? It doesn't feel like lost media to me, because what's lost isn't the materials created for Prototype 3, as much as it is the opportunity for what Prototype 3 could have been, but the same could be said about something like Silent Hills, and that feels much more like lost media, doesn't it? Of course, Silent Hills seems to have been much, much further along in development, possibly within a year of release when it was cancelled, so maybe that's what the difference is, right? But then, when did something change from simply being an idea to being media that can be lost? Is something like Newt lost media? Are the assets from Prototype 3 the lost media, not the hypothetical game they would have been used in? Do you see how we're sliding closer and closer to that theoretical lost media category I talked about at the very beginning? Prototype 3 doesn't exist, but it could have. Newt doesn't exist, but it could have. Star Wars 1313 doesn't exist, but it could have. I think there's definitely a difference between these examples, but it's hard to figure out where exactly that difference lies. The line is very blurry. The definition is getting increasingly blurry. Let's make it blurrier. Can something be lost media if it was released and it's currently fully accessible? Of course not, right? Well, there's even ambiguity there, because what if something was released, but it was very, very different from what was originally shown? My favorite illustration of this idea is The Emperor's New Groove. I know what you're thinking. The Emperor's New Groove isn't lost media, that's an extremely popular movie. I can go watch it on Disney Plus right now, you idiot. You moron, you buffoon, you fool, you ignoramus, you dummy, you nitwit, you dope, you dolt, you imbecile, you tuber. And you're right, The Emperor's New Groove isn't lost media, but Kingdom of the Sun 
the original vision of it, is. Kingdom of the Sun was originally a very different film from what was ultimately released, a full-scale Disney musical about an emperor named Manco and a simple llama farmer named Pacha, played by Owen Wilson in this version, who discover that they happen to look exactly alike. They decide to walk a mile in each other's shoes by switching places, but things are made more complicated by the machinations of an evil priestess, Yzva. This version of the film was tonally much more similar to other Disney films of the time, without the eccentric sense of humor which came to characterize the final film. Notably, the film's soundtrack was going to be written and at least partially performed by Sting, similarly to how Tarzan's soundtrack had previously been done in association with Phil Collins. Sting does appear in the final film, but his role in it was greatly reduced, and the songs which he worked on have not been fully documented or recovered. Because those working on the project, as well as the executives supervising it, were not happy with it, the project was immensely retooled, and eventually became the Emperor's New Groove we know and love today. The reason we know as much about Kingdom of the Sun as we do is because there was a documentary which covered the troubled production titled The Sweatbox, released in 2002. Kingdom of the Sun is a great example of this kind of drastic change during production because of how dramatic the difference between the original vision for the project and the final film are. But technically, Kingdom of the Sun did release under a different title. So the question is, should we count Kingdom of the Sun as lost media? If so, what exactly does that mean? It was never completed, so what exactly is lost media? The production materials? Those are widely available, with animation tests, cut songs, and many more freely available through either the sweatbox or just a quick search on the internet. No, when people talk about Kingdom of the Sun as lost media, what they're talking about is the theoretical world where Kingdom of the Sun was completed and released. For the record, I'm glad we don't live in that alternate universe, because The Emperor's New Groove is an absolute triumph, and the original version of the film, while fascinating, seems much worse. Another great example of this is Bioshock Infinite, a game released in 2013. Bioshock Infinite is infamous for having an absolutely insane amount of cut content, which shows not just one different direction which the game might have once taken, but several. The changes made to Bioshock Infinite are so sweeping that I'm not going to cover them all here, instead linking to an excellent video by Sourcebrew that covers the topic in depth in the description below. But virtually anything you could think of in the game was, at some point, different at some stage of development. Characters, actors, enemies, weapons, abilities, difficulty modes, the story, all of these things were drastically overhauled over and over again, which led to an incredibly long development cycle as well as trailers for drastically different versions of the game being shown several times. The game's ending even references many of these alternate versions of the game directly, although I won't say more than that here to avoid spoiling the game for anyone who hasn't played it. This is very similar to the example of Kingdom of the Sun, but here it's even harder to pin down what exactly is meant when referring to the lost Bioshock Infinite. Kingdom of the Sun is an amazing example because of how distinctly the project seems to have had two phases, and how easy they are to differentiate. Kingdom of the Sun was a more serious attempt at a typical Disney Renaissance film, and The Emperor's New Groove was an offbeat comedy that was released after the Renaissance is generally referred to as ending. Bioshock Infinite shows how much more complicated this subject is because of how many different versions of this game there seem to have been. Not just one alternate vision, but many. Bioshock Infinite is a dramatic example of this, but I mention it because it illustrates how projects change over the course of development. There was no point in Bioshock Infinite's development where the design pivoted entirely from some original vision to the final version of the game released. Instead, each of these changes were likely made one at a time, little by little. What is lost of Bioshock Infinite? Each developmental build? Each asset that was never used in any compiled builds of the game? If only one small thing changed between two development builds of a game, then are each of those builds a different example of lost media? This isn't the only gaming example either. 
The Ubisoft video game Zombie U began life as a schlocky horror-themed installment of the Rabbids franchise, called Attack of the Killer Rabbids from Outer Space, before deciding that this didn't fit with the Rabbids family-friendly branding, and pivoting the project. Metroid Dread began life as an original DS game, before being cancelled and then revived as a 2021 Switch release. This sort of change doesn't only happen in video games, of course. Scripts for movies change over time during the course of development, chapters and sections of a book get rewritten at a publisher's request, then resubmitted and changed again. The point I'm trying to make here is that this calls into question what exactly we're trying to preserve when we talk about lost media in this way. Is it worth archiving every single change made to every single Google Doc in a TV writer's room, even if some of those changes were only there for five minutes? If someone writes a tasteless joke into a book and then changes their mind and removes it before release, is that joke lost media? Is there historic value in trying to archive every change made to a project? If not, then where is the line that distinguishes between a change of historic significance and one which is inconsequential? Is a lost build of a game lost media? Is every lost build of a game lost media, no matter how slight the changes from one version to the next? Many builds of Angry Birds are now completely lost, but you can still easily go play Angry Birds right now. Does that mean Angry Birds is lost media? If a patch is released for a video game that fixes a bug, is that bug now lost media? What about a bug of real historic significance, like World of Warcraft's Corrupted Blood Plague, a bug which allowed disease to unintentionally spread in-game? absolutely devastating the in-game world and making large player population centers extremely dangerous. Corrupted Blood was a bug, and it was eventually fixed, but it was a bug of historic significance not only in the world of video games, but in real life, as it became the subject of study for epidemiologists for how an epidemic or pandemic could spread, with the Center for Disease Control contacting Blizzard to get more information about the incident after it took place information which became relevant to everyone in 2020. At the time of writing, the television adaptation of Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared has just recently been released. Now, obviously I haven't watched it because it hasn't been released in the US yet, but if I had watched it, I'd probably point out that the final show is dramatically different to what was shown of the original pilot in the Wakey Wakey teaser trailer back in 2018. That Wakey Wakey trailer has even been pulled off of the official Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared YouTube page although you can find re-uploads of it, so thankfully that doesn't qualify as lost media. Accounts of the original pilot, which was shown at Sundance in 2019, have described a very different show from the final project. The pilot featured the characters from the original show venturing out of their house into the wider world of an eccentric town called Clay Hill. But the final show is very similar to the original YouTube version. I found a reference to the creators pivoting the series because they felt the pilot ended up too much like South Park, but it was unsourced, so I'm not confident it's real. If you know where this idea comes from, please let me know, because I'm curious. Okay, so now we've talked over some really debatable cases of lost media, ones which there is significant disagreement over. Do these count? Do these not count? Are these a sort of lost media adjacent idea, but not lost media itself? Now, let's stretch this definition to its breaking point. With a type of search that is heavily associated with lost media, and often grouped together with it, but is by definition almost the opposite. What if you have the media, but that's all you have? The so-called most mysterious song on the internet is one of the most popular searches in recent years, but it wasn't actually lost. See, we have the song, you can listen to the song right now. lost is the attribution for the song. No one knows anything about the song, who recorded it, when it was recorded, where it was recorded, even what the title of the song is. There's a tremendous amount of lore associated with this song, 
It may even be identified now after years of searching, although there's still debate over that. Again, I'll provide links in the description which go into more detail about this story, but what I want to talk about here is how this relates to lost media. Again, should this be talked about as lost media at all? Can the attribution for a song be considered media which is lost? Can the broader cultural context in which it was recorded, the story of the song itself, be considered lost media? Here's another example, one of my personal favorites. You have likely played, or at least heard of, the video game Persona 4, but did you know that there was a huge mystery surrounding one of the performances in that game for a full decade? The actress who played Naoto Shirogane in the English version of the game went mysteriously uncredited. The mystery of who played Naoto surrounded this game for a long time. If you haven't played P4, this isn't a small side character with a few lines. Naoto is one of the main characters of the game, who appears throughout most of the experience. This mystery was finally solved in 2018, ten full years after the game's original release, when the voice actress Anna Graves confirmed that she was, in fact, Naoto. A similar story existed surrounding the actors who were in the live-action opening for the original Resident Evil, who played Rebecca Chambers, who played Jill Valentine, who played Barry Burton, and who played Chris Redfield, all having their own searches. These cases are all immediately notable, because in general we expect musicians and actors to be credited. In the era of IMDb, we expect that if we see an actor in a film, no matter how small their role, we're just a few keystrokes away from knowing their entire history of acting. But what about another medium where that expectation isn't the norm? Ghostwriting. If you're not familiar with the term, ghostwriting refers to the practice of an author being paid to write a book for someone else, with that someone else who is paying them being the one who will be credited as the book's author. It sounds insane when I say it out loud, but ghostwriting is a common practice with a long history. It's frequently used by celebrities and politicians without the time, skill, or interest in writing books of their own, and there's little cultural stigma surrounding the practice. It's common in the music industry as well, where pop stars writing their own material is seen as the exception, not the norm. Jenny Nicholson's excellent video on The Vampire Diaries brought up the fact that once the original creator was fired from her position with the series, some ghost writer or writers took up the mantle to write more books in the series, and that the author or authors of books 8 through 10 remain unidentified to this day. Is this sort of deliberate suppression of credit for a writer's work a form of lost media? If not, why? What about a situation where we have evidence of a property existing, but no further details about it? Since this is apparently the section where I'm going to reference Wang videos, the Gita's pins and stickers fit this mold. People had merchandise referencing a character called Gita's who came from something called the Land of Ta, but no information about the Land of Ta itself seemed to exist anywhere. Was it a cancelled animated film? A forgotten children's book? An elaborate troll? Merchandise that was just manufactured for the sake of manufacturing merchandise? No one knew, but the existence of merchandise certainly seemed to suggest the existence of some larger piece of obscure and forgotten lost media. This one was eventually solved, by the way, as the original artist for the stickers was identified. Okay, we've stretched the definition once again, but let's dial things back a bit. Next, let's talk about things that are pretty universally agreed to qualify as lost media. Things which are completely lost with no parts surviving, but are in fact so obscure, so lost, that it can't even be verified whether they exist at all. Hidogata is a piece of Japanese lost media, or possibly just a Japanese urban legend, that has at this point spread to the English-speaking internet as well. The legend tells of a creepy commercial or PSA which either aired on Japanese television or was shown in schools, depending on who you ask. The commercial displayed two white silhouettes and Japanese text which said something to the effect of, every two seconds, someone dies on Earth. Creepy music plays, and one of the figures fades out. There are conflicting reports on the details of what Hidogata featured, but it is generally agreed to be unsettling among those who claim to remember it. Now, this sounds like a creepypasta. It's got all the hallmarks of being something right out of Candle Cove. 
but there have been numerous reports of people claiming to remember the commercial over the years. Despite that, no footage of it can be found, and no record of it has been discovered. It's really easy to jump to the conclusion that Hidogata is fake, a creative writing exercise someone posted to the internet, or a false memory that spread across the internet like wildfire, but I'm not so sure. There are other famous lost media searches which sounded fake or sounded like creepypastas at the time, which wound up being completely real. Sesame Street's Cracks animation, the lost animated short known as Clockman, the lost Nickelodeon horror film Crybaby Lane, or my favorite example, the Subway Perfection ad, which sounded like a complete shitpost until it was suddenly found, with the memory having been shockingly accurate. I don't know if Hidogata is real, but I'm not willing to say it's fake. Another interesting example of unconfirmed lost media is the English dub of the Pokemon episode Electric Soldier Porygon. Electric Soldier Porygon, or Computer Warrior Porygon, or Deno Senshi Porygon, or whatever other name you might know it by, is an infamous episode of the Pokemon anime which featured flashing red and white lights that triggered epileptic seizures across Japan, and hospitalized many children. Because of that, the episode has never been re-aired, although the episode itself is still preserved and you can find it online, so it's not lost media. What is possibly lost media is the English dub of the episode. See, the English dub of the episode has never been released, never been officially mentioned, and possibly was never made. Veronica Taylor, the original English voice actress for Ash, once said in an interview that the episode was never dubbed. So mystery solved, right? Well, not so fast, because Maddie Blaustein, the original voice actress for Meowth, and Eric Stewart, the voice actor for both Brock and James, have both said that they did, in fact, record a dub for the episode. So how do we square that circle? Well, one possibility is that the production on the episode's dub was started, and that both Blaustein and Stewart recorded their parts, but it was cancelled before Taylor recorded hers. Another possibility, given the existence of several other banned episodes of Pokemon whose English dubs have resurfaced, such as Beauty and the Beach, is that Blaustein and Stewart were confusing one lost episode with another. It's hard to say, and given the extremely strong ban on the episode from the Pokemon Company, and how they have no desire to remind anyone of the biggest disaster in their franchise's history, where they almost killed a bunch of kids, I don't expect this mystery to be solved anytime soon. Although if it is real, you can never rule out a leak. My gut says that the dub of this episode probably doesn't exist at all, but it's impossible to know for sure. Okay, one more piece of unconfirmed lost media I want to talk about, because of how hilariously bizarre it is. Charlie is an unconfirmed dub of the children's show Caillou, with the only difference being that the main character's name was changed to Charlie in every instance. The theme song, the dialogue, the logo, everything. Yeah, this isn't real. But you know what? I almost hope I'm wrong because the idea of this existing is so hilarious to me that I want it to be real. That's as good a transition as any to talk about fake lost media, right? Fake lost media is, of course, not lost media, it's fake. But I feel like the discussion around lost media would be incomplete without talking about some interesting examples of fake lost media, and how fake lost media can happen, both as a hoax and as something a bit more complicated. First, one of my favorite lost media videos ever, and one of my favorite lost media channels ever, who I've used as a source numerous times throughout this video, is Sourcebrew, and his video on the fake lost media iceberg. Shout out to Sourcebrew, by the way. I was stuck in bed for weeks earlier this year while recovering from a back surgery, and listening to his channel while mindlessly playing Genshin Impact seriously got me through a lot of pain. That guy deserves way more subs. He's one of my favorite channels on all of YouTube. Saki Sanabashi, also known by the title Go For A Punch, is an alleged anime whose existence was first referred to on the bastion of credibility on the internet known as 4chan, in a thread about the worst thing you'd ever seen on the deep web. Let's just say it was about a group of anime schoolgirls trapped in a bathroom 
who met their untimely ends. If you know, you know. Link in the description if you've somehow missed this one. Again, there's a tremendous amount of lore associated with this thing, but suffice to say that no evidence of its existence could ever be found. A user claiming to be the original poster would later say that the entire thing had been a hoax, but due to the original post's anonymous nature, it's impossible to prove if this person actually is the same person who originally posted about it, so... shrug? Even aside from that, it really does seem like some sort of evidence would have shown up for what this anime was, but every supposed lead has been debunked, or sourced to something else, so it's widely considered to be a hoax. A Day with Spongebob Squarepants is maybe the single most well-documented piece of lost media in existence. This is a much, much, much more complicated story, involving shadowy figures, shell companies, possible money laundering schemes, and a lot of fake leads. In a nutshell, people one day noticed several online retailers had listings for a movie called A Day with Spongebob Squarepants, The Movie, or The Unauthorized Mockumentary. The film was listed as having been released in 2011, but all online retailers were sold out of it, and no secondhand copies could be found anywhere. This led to a deep rabbit hole that got incredibly weird as the whole thing was tied to a sketchy production company with shadowy Deep Throat-esque informants getting involved, all because of SpongePants Square Bob. The further the whole thing went, the stranger the story got. Seriously, there are a bunch of, like, full-length documentaries you can find about this story if you go looking for them. I'll put Blame It on Jorge's video in the description, but the whole investigation was a trip. Suffice to say, it's currently believed that the film was never actually produced. This probably isn't a hoax, as much as it is an accidental listing getting put on Amazon, and then a bunch of other retailers copying it from Amazon, but the whole story is exceptionally, exceptionally weird. Also, Kekroc. I'm going to say the word Kekroc. Kekroc isn't real. You know how I know? Because Keck is a 4chan meme. We all knew that Keck is a big 4chan meme, right? I've, I've seen people talk about Keck Rock, and whether it's real or not, but I've never seen anyone bring up the fact that Keck is a 4chan meme, originating from a lol translating into Keck in World of Warcraft when a character speaking orcish would say it to a player from the opposing faction. Croc 3 was already a meme in the Lost Media community because of a previous hoax, so I mean, Keck plus Croc equals Keck Croc. If you have no idea what that last part was talking about, you've lived a better life than I have. The most interesting example of fake lost media of all time, though, in my opinion, is the Evil Farming Game. In short, the Evil Farming Game was a game which a Redditor was looking for, which played similarly to Harvest Moon or Stardew Valley, with the twist being that the player character began the game by killing his wife, and that in addition to all of the farming and social systems which a player would naturally expect from the genre, you would have to use your farmland to hide your wife's body, and periodically move it as well as cover your tracks, in order to stay one step ahead of the police and your suspicious neighbors. This game caught on like wildfire because it Honestly, it sounds like a really interesting game, a dark subversion of the whole life sim genre. It's a super messed up idea, but that sort of messed up idea appeals to players who enjoy unique and bizarre dark experiences in gaming. The search was on, and it lasted for years. Every few months, a new lead would pop up. Could this be the evil farming game? Nothing seemed to fit perfectly, even though some very interesting games were brought up and given the attention of an entirely new audience. The solution would, unfortunately, be something of an anticlimax. The game was a false memory. This solution was reached when one user was watching an old Vine Sauce video where he joked about the game Body Harvest, a Nintendo 64 game created by DMA Designs, now Rockstar Games. He joked that the game sounded like Harvest Moon with dead bodies. Upon this video resurfacing, the original poster seeking the evil farming game confirmed that this was the origin of the memory. They used to fall asleep while listening to these videos, and must have had the idea subconsciously planted in their head, causing them to dream the evil farming game into existence. This is such a fascinating example of fake lost media, because it's not a hoax, there were no bad faith actors involved in any step of the process. Fine Sauce wasn't representing the game as something that actually existed, he was just riffing on an old N64 title. The original poster wasn't trying to deceive anyone, 
They honestly thought this was a memory of a real game they had experienced. Human memory is an incredibly faulty thing, and we all have more false memories than we realize, which is why it can be so hard to determine whether lost media is real or fake. Okay, so now that we've taken a detour into fake lost media, let's get back to the main topic, things which strain the classification of lost media. What about cases where the media itself isn't lost, it's the experience which is? Let's start here. You guys remember HQ Trivia? HQ Trivia was an app which took the world by storm in 2017, functioning as a live game show that anyone could become a contestant in. Each day, HQ Trivia would broadcast games at specific times, and players who tuned in live had a chance to compete for real cash prizes by answering a few rounds of trivia questions without failing. This was a huge thing when it launched, it gave players the chance to live out lifelong fantasies of competing on a game show for real with real prizes at stake. As time went on though, the app was involved in several scandals, such as the original host being unceremoniously fired for becoming too popular, one of the co-creators of the app passing away from a drug overdose, and persistent criticism of the app's method of paying out winners, or failure to pay out to winners. Couple this with the app losing money hand over fist, and the app was forced to shut down in February of 2020, with the final game being a bizarre spectacle, with the hosts getting wildly drunk on camera and celebrating the loss of their jobs with an absurdly low prize pool of $5, put up for grabs by the hosts themselves. The final game actually had over 500 winners, meaning everyone won less than a cent per person. So, uh, fun fact! Did you know that HQ Trivia still exists? Yeah, so I wrote down HQ Trivia in my outline for this script because I was like, oh, that's a great example of what I'm talking about. People remember that. That'll be illustrative. But I guess HQ Trivia was only offline for a few months before returning. I seriously didn't know this until I was researching for this video. I have not heard a single person talk about this game since that disaster of a final episode in 2020, so I assume it's doing great. Um, so yeah, bad example, because it was only lost media for a couple of months, but, uh, that whole, that whole the winners won less than a penny per person thing was interesting, right? Aren't you guys glad I didn't cut this part out? Wait, let me, let me start over. One vs. 100 was an Xbox 360 adaptation of the television game show of the same name, which was released in 2009. Same idea as HQ Trivia, but predating it. The game had scheduled matches, which were only available to play at certain times. If you've never seen the show, it's a trivia game show where one player is trying to win money by beating 100 members of The Mob, while The Mob were trying to outlast The One as a group. If The One was able to outlast The 100, they would win a large cash prize, while if The One was eliminated, the remaining members of The Mob would split the prize accumulated so far. For the video game version, upon joining the app at the scheduled times, you would either become a spectator, essentially watching an episode of the show, become a member of the mob, or if you were really lucky, become the one. Much like HQ Trivia, 1 vs 100 let players live out their fantasy of being a real game show contestant. The problem is, you might have realized, because the game was essentially a live television game show, it was only available as long as not only the servers were maintained, but as long as a team behind the scenes kept constantly working on keeping the game running for each scheduled match. After two so-called seasons, the game was cancelled. There's plenty of footage of the game available online, and if you want to find the files for the game, you absolutely can. Those files, however, are absolutely useless without ongoing support for the game. 1 vs 100 isn't technically lost. You can go download it right now, but obviously there's no point in doing so, the experience of playing the game itself is completely lost. This is something which we've seen as a reality of online games for years now. Any game that works based off of servers, off of an active internet connection, will one day become lost media. MMOs have been especially notable for this, with MMOs like Star Wars Galaxies, The Matrix Online, City of Heroes, and plenty more being lost forever. Of course, 
Since I've got a history with Final Fantasy XIV content on this channel, I would be remiss in not mentioning the original version of Final Fantasy XIV before A Realm Reborn launched. Even, I think you could argue, different eras of a single MMO qualify. Think of the way people talk about WoW Classic as opposed to WoW Retail. These are completely different games. Even WoW Classic has some notable differences from the original version of the game which it was released to archive. Plus, of course, the experience of World of Warcraft Classic upon release was dramatically different from the experience people had with the 2004 original, despite how closely the content matched the original. You can't go home again. Of course, dead MMOs usually aren't talked about as lost media, because if you really want to play those games right now, most of the high-profile ones have private servers available, which allow you to do so. Still, I don't feel fully comfortable calling the experience of playing an MMO on a private server the same as playing the original game. Private servers often make changes to the game, allow you to skip content or essentially enter god mode for free, and so on. Plus, your characters from the original game aren't brought forward to private servers, and so your characters from dead MMOs definitely qualify as lost. I'm not saying I think private servers are bad, far from it. I think they're essential in preserving the history of these games. I'm just saying, they aren't quite the originals, you know? Oh, also, I need to say real quick, Marvel Heroes died so that Square Enix's terrible, terrible Avengers game could live, and that is a travesty. I miss you, Marvel Heroes. <sighs> let's, let's talk about historic lost media. Something which is absolutely a form of lost media, but which isn't usually the first thing that comes to mind when the subject is brought up, are significant missing historic documents or pieces of ancient lost literature. I think this is worth talking about in this video, not because there's much debate over whether or not these qualify, but just because they aren't something that quickly comes to mind or quickly gets talked about by the lost media community. The most famous example of historic lost media is, of course, the Library of Alexandria. Or, I suppose, the texts contained within it. If you're feeling a little fuzzy on your Greek-Egyptian history, let me give you a quick refresher. The Library of Alexandria was a, well, a library in Alexandria, Egypt, during Egypt's Ptolemaic era. It was considered the greatest library in the world at its height, and, in turn, led Alexandria to be known as the capital of knowledge in the world. The story of the Library of Alexandria goes, during the reign of Julius Caesar, he ordered the ships in the bay to be burned, while Alexandria was under siege. Wind caused some stray embers to be carried to the library, and before long, the entire thing had caught fire, utterly destroying it. The knowledge contained in the Library of Alexandria was… lost. Beowulf is an old English poem, which has become one of the most translated, most studied, and most influential pieces of Western literature. Yet, parts of this poem were destroyed, and have never been recovered. These passages are yet another kind of lost media. Many alleged books of the Bible were lost upon being declared non-canonical, and some are debated on whether or not they existed in the first place. Should these be considered lost media, and if so, are they worth preserving? I imagine your answer will probably change depending on your own religious beliefs. It's obvious why examples like this don't get as much attention within the lost media community as the other things I've talked about in this video. The reason why artifacts like this are rarely discussed by the internet lost media community in general is because, well, they aren't very actionable. You're not exactly likely to find the Nintendo PlayStation sitting in your attic somewhere, but as we've seen, it's still a lot more likely that the average person will find that than it is that you'll trip over a lost verse of the epic of Beowulf. Most people don't have access to the knowledge or resources required to search for something like that, and even those that do, finding something like that would be the archaeological find of a lifetime. Okay, now let's get into the really fringe stuff. Let's talk about the stuff that if you talk about in terms of being lost media, people will tell you you're wrong about. This kind of thing isn't even allowed to be listed on the lost media wiki. Let's talk about physical lost media. So let's cut to the chase. Do physical items qualify as lost media? This is a really divisive topic. The lost media wiki, for example, doesn't have a category for such. 
Still, there are many videos talking about lost merchandise among popular lost media enthusiasts. I mentioned a sticker sheet earlier in this video, and the found media in that case ended up being some concept sketches for the stickers in question. How is that different from a doll or a plushie? The interesting thing to me about physical lost media, and considering whether or not it counts as lost media, is that it requires us to ask the same question asked about media which is archived but merely inaccessible. What does it mean to be found media? When people talk about lost plushies or merchandise, the merchandise is often well documented on the internet. What is lost, then, is the experience, right? Well, how do you find that media, then? No matter the search, it will never be possible for everyone to gain direct access to a particular prototype plushie. So what does it mean to find this merchandise? Archiving it? Preserving it? The idea of physical lost media also calls into question how we define media. The dictionary definition of media, one definition at least, is the plural form of medium, which means a form of expression. I'd certainly say that a plush toy, or a cardboard standee, or any other form of merchandise would qualify as a form of expression, of communication. When someone creates a Sonic the Hedgehog Halloween costume, that is expressing an idea, communicating the idea of Fast Blue Rat existing to the viewer. But where do we draw the line with this? Are all physical items media? Anything that is disposed of media? There's a lot of interest in archiving promotional material. What about something like packaging? I would say packaging absolutely counts as a form of media. When you're reselling a game or a movie, not having the original packaging greatly devalues it and collectors are as interested in preserving the box something came in as they are in preserving the item itself. If we had, for example, a game that was actively preserved, but not the box it originally shipped in, is that box lost media? Packaging is an entire industry of its own. It's easy to ignore, but for every box you've ever bought something in, whether it's a video game or a box of saltine crackers, it was someone's full-time job to design that box and a lot of thought went into it. What about bootleg merchandise? There's bootleg merchandise out there that's infamous enough to have its own cult following, but due to the nature of these items, they're never really intended to be archived or preserved. What about bootleg video games? What defines the difference between a bootleg video game and a fan-made video game? Quality? Many of the most commonly accepted pieces of lost media aren't considered to be high-quality works. What about prototype merchandise? How distinct from the original version does it need to be to count as its own thing? We can go down this rabbit hole further and further, and eventually we end up reaching a point that's so far over the line that it becomes farcical. If I use all of the ink out of a pen and throw it away, is that pen lost media? Or to circle back to something else LSSQ once said as a joke, if I eat a piece of pizza, is that pizza now lost media? Of course not. Again, I'm setting up a straw man argument on purpose here, not because I'm actually trying to claim that pizza is lost media, it pretty obviously isn't, but by pushing this so far past the boundary between an edge case and something that clearly isn't lost media, it illustrates that there was some kind of boundary to cross. Where exactly that boundary lies is a little bit harder to define though, and it's subjective. Ask two people where exactly that boundary lies and you're going to get two different answers. By now, it's pretty clear that I've stretched the definition of lost media well past its breaking point. Now that we've completely broken the idea of lost media, we're almost done. In the same vein as physical lost media being highly debatable, we must ask, can real life events be lost media? A few months ago, my wife and I had the pleasure of visiting Omega Mart. If you don't know what Omega Mart is, then it's my pleasure to direct you to a video of deepfake Willie Nelson describing it to you. Hey, what's Omega Mart? Huh? Omega Mart? What's Omega Mart? Yeah! What, what is, is Omega, Omega Mart? Mart? What's with all the questions? Howdy, I'm Willie Nelson. Omega Mart is just a totally normal supermarket in Las Vegas, and I'm a celebrity you can trust. Willie? Really? Willie? Really? Yep, that's me. Omega Mart has all the under-refrigerated dairy you need and all the organically recommended produce you want, all in one place. Not to mention the world's friendliest free-range staff. 
Around here, the only thing that's suspicious are the prices. That's really good value. Omega Mart puts the super in. What kind of grocery store is this? So stop asking questions. And come sample the savings for yourself. Howdy, partner. It's like we always say. Uh-oh, oh, Omega Mart. You have no idea what's in store for you. Just off I-15 in Las Vegas, next to the Big Gorilla. Tickets on sale now. Omega Mart is an art installation in Las Vegas, Nevada, at Area 15, by the art group Meow Wolf. A trip through a surreal grocery store, which allows visitors to experience a narrative at their own pace by reading journals, watching commercials, and essentially digging into the conspiracy of the Dram Corporation and its mysterious missing founder, Walter Dram. You know the experience of reading item descriptions and looking at environmental details of a Dark Souls game as you play through it, and trying to piece everything together to understand what's going on? Omega Mart is sort of like that experience, but in real life. My wife and I spent eight hours there and took over a thousand photos unraveling the mystery of Dramcorp, and I'm looking forward to doing so again on another trip to Vegas somewhere down the line. As a former Vegas local, I'm going to tell you, Omega Mart is the single coolest thing I've ever seen in Vegas. If you have any kind of chance to go do it, I cannot recommend it highly enough. The thing is, as someone who has spent most of my life in Vegas, I'm in the somewhat unique, or at least relatively rare in the grand scheme of things, position of knowing people who have gone to Omega Mart not just once, but half a dozen times or more since it opened in 2021. What I've learned from this is that the version of Omega Mart I visited in May of 2022 was significantly different from the version of Omega Mart that existed when it opened in February of 2021. The original story received complaints of being too long, too complicated, and too confusing, and so drastic changes have been made to the exhibit not only to streamline the process for newcomers, but also to try to give those who had visited before a reason to come back and see the changes to the exhibit. So to me, this raises the question, can Omega Mart, the original version of Omega Mart, which opened in 2021, be considered lost media? There's plenty of documentation of Omega Mart from its opening due to the incredible success of the installation, but due to the scope and nature of the exhibit, it seems very possible to me that there are details that are not documented, or that people don't even realize that they have footage of. Not to mention, if the experience is what we're actually talking about, that the experience of original Omega Mart is no longer available. So is that a form of lost media? What about something a little bit more abstract? Something with less of a narrative? Like perhaps an obscure restaurant promotion? In 2017, Sonic the Hedgehog decided to market the upcoming Sonic Forces with the most natural cross promotion it could think of, Sonic the Hedgehog themed Hooters. This is real. It was a Japan thing, because of course it was. Again, I'll say, link in the description. Is going to a Sonic the Hedgehog themed Hooters lost media? There were unique drinks, unique crossover merchandise. The restaurant was covered in Sonic the Hedgehog plushies. That's certainly a hell of an experience that you can't have anymore. How about this one? Does something need to be recorded at all in order to qualify as lost media? Is a concert that was never recorded, even bootlegged, lost media? Lost music is considered lost media, and lost recording variants of songs are considered lost media, so is an undocumented concert lost media? What about something more historically significant? Is a disaster, or some significant historical event which no footage can be found of, lost media? Lost news coverage is often considered a form of lost media, so what about someone's home movie that is interrupted by an earthquake, or a crime? What if the event was never recorded at all? What about all of history that existed before cameras? We've now broadened our definition so far that all of human history is considered lost media. Clearly, this is no longer a useful or practical definition. I cannot stress this enough. No, I do not actually think that all of human history before the invention of the camera is considered lost media. At some point, we went too far. I'm almost done now. I want to talk about one more thing really briefly before we wrap this up. Criminal lost media. 
I said at the beginning of this video that I didn't want this to be about my own personal feelings of what does and does not qualify as lost media, and was going to avoid giving my own opinion for the most part, but now we've reached the exception. I'm not going to talk about any specific examples or details here, so don't worry, if you don't want to hear about anything too grisly, I'm not going to get into it. But if you're really sensitive to hearing about the existence of violent or extreme content, then feel free to skip ahead to the conclusion. I'll be breaking this video out into chapters below. If you start looking into lost media, eventually you'll get far enough down on the iceberg that the conversation shifts from being about fun old Nickelodeon episodes and lost Disney Channel bumpers into things like Squidward's Suicide or Saki Sanapashi or Dead Bart, and that's all well and good. None of those things exist, but Lost media is inherently kind of mysterious, kind of creepy. It makes sense that it would cross over with creepypasta. But then you start digging even deeper, and you start getting to things like, oh, recordings of this shooting, or oh, this snuff film made by this serial killer. You know, things that are held onto by the cops, by the authorities. So in my opinion, that isn't lost media, that's evidence. I'm not trying to make some puritanical argument here. I'm a true crime junkie. I get it. I do. I have listened to my share of podcasts talking about ways in which people were murdered or details about crimes or investigations, all that stuff. I'm not saying that everyone who has an interest in gore content is secretly a serial killer or anything like that. I think that when this sort of content is listed as lost media, it lays two pretty big questions about lost media in front of us. The first really isn't related to the taboo nature of the subject matter, and the second very much is. The first question is, are things which were never intended for a wide audience lost media? This taps into the other dictionary definition of the word media, which is the form we're using when we talk about the media, and that is, the means of mass communication. Books are media because they are meant to communicate ideas with the masses. The internet is media because it allows us to communicate with the entire world. But if I go to Disneyland and I take a home movie while I'm riding the Dumbo, and that's really only meant for a handful of people, then is that media? Again, this is a gray area. And home movies are a form of expression, so yeah, by one definition it's lost media. And by another, it isn't. The second question, though, asks us to consider what deserves being archived. What's worth remembering? That's certainly not a question that's only related to this criminal category. You can ask that question about most pieces of lost media, to be honest. Out of Jimmy's Head was a terrible TV series. I remember, I was there, and let me tell you, we're all better off without it. Cartoon Network not releasing it or rerunning it is kind of doing the kids of today a favor. At the same time, it's something that clearly many people worked on and put time and effort and care into. And just because something is poorly made, I don't think that means it should just be ignored or forgotten. Out of Jimmy's Head is harmless. If Out of Jimmy's Head were freely available, it would be very, very easy for me to avoid ever watching it again, or thinking about it again. Honestly, the only reason I've thought about it in the last 10 years is in relation to lost media. That and because it's a really good example of the Walt Disney's frozen head myth. But then we get into the question of things that are not harmless. Talking about something as lost media inherently implies that it's worth finding and Many of these things are not. Tapes of cannibalism, or murders caught on tape, these are things that can, arguably, cause societal harm. Of course, this calls into question free speech. There are plenty of people out there who will argue that we should be allowed to freely post videos of real-life violence to the internet for all sorts of reasons. Some of those reasons are good, some of those reasons are less good. It isn't my place to decide where free speech ends and censorship begins, and that's not a power any one person should have. What I find frustrating, though, is when these things are listed as lost media. Not everyone is going to agree with me here, but I feel like this subject is broader than the discussion of lost media and should be talked about separately. Like I said before, I'm a true crime junkie. I get it. Hearing about the darkest parts of humanity is fascinating. I think this stuff is worth talking about, worth acknowledging. So, I'm not going to make any sort of moral appeal. Rather, I want to make the appeal that I think it's really lame when people do this. Like, when I'm watching a video about lost media and we suddenly pivot from talking about mythical kablam episodes to recordings made by real-life murderers, it hits the same part of my brain that's annoyed when some smartass says Die Hard is their favorite Christmas movie. It's a gotcha. It's just like, okay. 
I can't say that you're wrong, but that wasn't what we were talking about. You know that wasn't what we were talking about. I know you know that wasn't what we were talking about. So let's just pivot to this entirely different conversation, I guess. Not everyone is going to agree with me here, and that's fine. I'm probably going to get yelled at for the hot take that we shouldn't be talking about astrology with Squidward and the murder tapes in the same conversation. Not even that we shouldn't be talking about the murder tapes at all, but it's my YouTube video, so luckily I can say whatever the hell I want. Anyway, I've said my piece. Classification is hard. Not just the classification of lost media, but the classification of anything is hard. That's because classification is a human construct, born of the human desire to order a chaotic world. Sometimes the classification works great, but for every classification, there will always be cases that stretch the definition of what fits in that category, and what defies any classification at all. I think there's value in examining the boundaries of this topic, because I think there's value in having a better understanding of this topic and how complicated it really is, how broad a field of research lost media has become over the past few years. I don't want this video to be about which of these things are or are not lost media, because the truth is, I think there's value in examining all of them. All of these topics are interesting. Whether it's a song no one remembered, which many people ended up falling in love with, or finding lost animations from childhood that never got the attention they deserved. People want to say this isn't lost media for a lot of these subjects as though that invalidates them, and in truth, yeah, personally, I don't think a lot of these things qualify as lost media. But that doesn't make them less fascinating, that doesn't make them less worth remembering. The thing that arguments over lost media, what is lost media, and what isn't lost media reveal is how strongly people feel about this topic. I think to an outsider, that passion for finding lost media can be a little weird. Like, who cares if a bootleg mockumentary of SpongeBob SquarePants is ever discovered? There's a billion pieces of disposable media just like that which I can go buy off the bargain rack at Big Lots right now. Who cares, right? The thing about the story of the Library of Alexandria is that it's actually the subject of considerable academic debate to this day whether the library was actually destroyed, partially destroyed, or entirely fine, and the whole thing was greatly overstated. If you don't want to dig through articles, I'll include a link in the description to an excellent Jacob Geller video where he discusses this, as well as other absolutely amazing stories about libraries. The cultural idea of the Library of Alexandria, though, is indisputably that it was completely lost. When you say the Library of Alexandria, people will think the greatest loss of knowledge in human history. The burning of the Great Library is so ingrained in our very culture that it exists as shorthand for the tragic loss of knowledge, of potential, and of literature. It seems that whether or not the library was actually destroyed thousands of years ago hardly matters, because the library has become this great tragic symbol of how fragile knowledge itself can be. It exists more as a parable than a history lesson. What was actually lost in Alexandria? Who knows? It's the idea that so much was lost at all which gives the story such power. We'd all be living on Mars by now if only Caesar had kept a better fire code. So much work, so much effort, so much potential, and so much knowledge squandered. What is lost media if not a modern day version of this parable writ large? What is the internet if not the modern library of Alexandria? The internet is forever, we say. Anything you could ever want to find, anything you could ever want to know, it's only a few keystrokes away. When we see something that contradicts that, it scares us. When we remember something, even something silly, even something small, and we find out that we can't go back to experience it again, it feels wrong. When I think of Out of Jimmy's Head, I remember it being a terrible show, something that I never should have watched in the first place, and something which I never want to watch again. There's no great personal loss to finding out that Out of Jimmy's Head is lost media, because I was never going to watch it again anyway. Yet, when I found out that Out of Jimmy's Head, this show I have this really strong memory of watching as a kid, was gone, was missing, that I couldn't watch it now if I wanted to, there's something unsettling about that. Lost media searches often seem to assume that there is a world where we'll be able to perfectly catalog all of human knowledge. But that's not possible. The reason why lost media as a definition is kind of blurry 
is because the premise of Lost Media itself is sort of built on a false ideal. The concept of some media being lost inherently suggests that most media is permanent, is archived, and that there might someday no longer be any lost media. But time waits for no obscure cartoon, and as it goes, things will be forgotten. As time marches on, more media in existence will be lost than will be preserved. Is every plush toy destroyed by a family pet lost media? Is every half-written manuscript thrown in the trash by a Starbucks barista without being shown to anyone lost media? Maybe, but we'll never be able to see and preserve everything. And that's okay. Maybe the greatest novel of all time is sitting on someone's hard drive right now, and it'll never be shown to anyone. Maybe everything we've recovered will just wind up lost again someday. That's happened before. We preserve what we can, and it's impossible to know what we've lost. For every Beowulf, there are thousands of other old English poems that are lost forever. For every play written by Shakespeare, there are hundreds of flops that never made it to the Globe Theatre. For every Avatar The Last Airbender, there's a cancelled Banjo-Kazooie cartoon. For every piece of lost media that's remembered just enough for a search to begin, there's something that has been truly forgotten. It's impossible to know how much truly forgotten media there is. After all, how would we know?